everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm Lloyd Hill. Welcome to this week's um, Indexing Transformation Seminar. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Abram de Swan, and I'll do so by way of a little anecdote. I first met Abram a couple of years ago in Vienna when I was attending the, um, uh, the annual, I think it was a Congress. It was a Congress? Yeah. Or it was uh, a Congress. Yeah, yeah, European Sociology. Yeah, uh, the International Sociological Association yeah. uh, meeting there. Um, we're both members of, of um, working group, was it 25, Language and, and Society. And I listened to Abram present, I think, something fairly similar to, yes. to, to what you're going to be talking about yes. today. And I remember asking a, 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 question, a question, which I can't remember what, what it was, but Abram seemed to think it was reasonably intelligent. Uh, I was quite interested in, in what he had to say back then. And then I went, but I didn't know about anything about him. I'd only j just seen him there. So I went back and I Googled, and I was quite surprised to, to, to realize that he'd written quite an interesting book, this one, called Words, Words of the World, um, the World Language System. Um, and what was also struck me was that he wrote this based on a series of lectures uh, presented at the Collège de France um, uh, where he had, been w he had been invited by Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu. So he actually worked, worked, worked quite closely with, with Pierre Bourdieu on that, who, you know, as you know, is probably the best sociologist in the world, having, having worked, uh, worked on, on, on language. Um, so I, I mean, I've read this book, and um, I must just say that Abram has quite a wide range of interests. I must just give you some sense of what he's also done. I mean, in addition to writing this book, he's written a book on genocide. Um, and his most recent book, if I, if I just give you the subtitle, I'm going to get into trouble, the, the, the main title. And the main title is Against Women, but the subtitle is important. <laughs> what is the subtitle? The subtitle, I need almost two, two <laughs> seconds of tension, and then it is The World Wide War Against Emancipation by Rightists and Fundamentalists. Okay. <laughs> That's the most latest Can book. I stay? Which, which, uh, you're going to be asked to come back next week. Unfortunately, you've gone. Uh, um, so just to, I'm, I'm going to hand over to, to Abram now. Um, just for those of you that, that have the time as well, uh, we're going to, Abram's going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes. Right. And then as usual, we're going to, we're going to take questions. Um, we, at the, we're going to break it about half past two as usual. Um, and then take a half hour break, and at three o'clock, um, we're going to have a, a roundtable discussion of a chapter that, I, that I've distributed. That's in a new book on that kind of connects linguistics, and it's, it's, a, it's an edited book. He's got one chapter in the book, but it's a, the title of the book is basically linguistics and economics. Uh, it's by uh, uh, Sally Coco Mouvain and, and Cecil Vigano. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, my, I must just warn you that if you want to come to that, I'm going to put a notice on the board, but it's not going to be in, in sociology because we run out of space. It's going to be in information science uh, at, the, at the end of the corridor for those of you who want to come. OK, so uh, Abram, welcome. Thank you. Well, hello, all of you. I'm truly pleased to be here because it's a little adventure to stand in front of people who each of them separately know more about one part of what I will be talking about, languages in South Africa, than I do. So I'm the most ignorant in this matter. Bear with me and uh, enlighten me. Uh, that was called a captatio benevolentia, an attempt at the benevolence of the audience. And sometimes you might need that. My work has been. Uh, on the world system of languages. And the idea was a very elementary idea, which at the time probably was novel, and that is that after all, there must be thousands and thousands of groups of people who speak a language which they, within the group, understand, but which no other of all these thousands of groups uh, understands. So mankind, since the curse of Babel, is fragmented in thousands and thousands of language groups. But for the existence of multilingual people who speak more than one language and therefore can connect these groups. Now, I'm aware that between most groups, 
the uh, say frontiers of unintelligibility are not all that distinct. Mostly, languages tend to be fluid, to shade into another one, to change all the time. People adopt words and forms of speech. It's all in movement, which makes it even harder. Basically, even though we talk about distinct languages, they are more like clouds. There's a cloud over there, which is absolutely isolated by blue from the others. That must be, let's say, uh, what? Uh, Arabic. Certainly, Afrikaans is not Arabic. They're very, very different. But Afrikaans and Dutch is already somewhat of a problem. Are they distinct languages? Or, say, the Afrikaans of the Malay people who came here, or of the black farmhands who learned it on the farms. Are they distinct languages from the Afrikaans of the Boer? It's an open question. Uh, for example, I think it's not much an effort for a Dutch person to understand official Afrikaans. Just a little effort and you sort of get it. But still, these two language groups ignore one another almost completely for a host of reasons. So languages are not e easily countable. Some clouds sort of shade into one another. But we can make an effort. Now I must say that especially Europeans and all those linguists who are European-oriented tend to, to, to think of, no, not linguists, but people who think spontaneously about language, tend to, think, tend to think about language as as distinct from the next one, as permanent, and as well regulated as the states they live in. Dutch stops at the borders, except for Flemish. Uh, it's permanent, there are dictionaries and there are grammars and you can learn it in school. It's very clear what's good Dutch and what's bad Dutch. Bad Dutch. It's completely regulated just as Dutch society is almost completely regulated. That is basically the spontaneous idea when, say, people who are oriented to Western culture think about language. People who live on the ground, say, in the in African rainforests, or in Brazil, or in Papua New Guinea, know that from one village to another there are considerable differences, but somehow people navigate, manage to sort of understand each other with hands and feet, but also because they have intermediate language. Their clouds shade into one another. So when you talk about the world system of languages, first of all, you must not so much look at the six, but at the three zeros. 6,000 in mathematics means more or less between 5,500 and 6,500 with a, let's say, uh, probability of 90%. These are very, very rough estimates. Uh, you could also think of this more than any person could ever learn in a lifetime. These 6,000 peripheral or peripheral languages, and I call them moons, and you will soon see why. These are languages without a state. Sometimes it's said a dialect is a language without the protection of a state. They have no grammars, they have no printed literature, they have no dictionaries, they have no language police, um, but they have something which are other language groups have to a lesser degree. These are very often the languages of memory because the only way to convey and keep a text for the next generation is by memorizing it. So I like to call them languages of memory rather than talk about what they have not. They have got something. These peripheral languages nowadays, almost all of them, are within the sphere of power and influence of states, usually national states. And that means that uh, for a host of reasons, they will try not to learn the language of their neighbors, but the language of the market, the language of the police, 
the language of papers, the language of office jobs, the language of getting a driver's license, and what have you, the language of the central states. So they learn languages upward. And by the way, almost all language learning goes upwards. So these, these peripheral languages sort of circle around a central state like moons around a planet. But those central languages, I say 200, if you want to say 100 or 250, I'm not going to quarrel. But I took the number of member states of the United Nations, which is, I think, 192 by my last count. These are state languages. They got, uh, they're the official language, usually in the Constitution, it says it's the language of the land. As when you were three years old, you start being corrected how to talk, what to, how to say. When you're six years old, you learn to read in them. Uh, and you have a feeling that outside of your world of speech, there is something called the language, which you must navigate very carefully. And there is a huge library in that language, and printing presses, and linguists, and school teachers and let's say the complete protection of the state. But nowadays in the modern world, these state languages, these uh, planets as I've called them, circulate around a sun. And that sun, those suns are the super central languages. They are the languages of long distance communication, of continental or subcontinental uh, uh, contacts. Again, 12 means 8 or 15 or whatever you wish. It means, I say 12, but I'm not going to pick any quarrel about it. Let's think. What would be a language of long distance communication? Arabic. Or Malay. Or Chinese. Or Portuguese or Spanish, or English, or French, these last four languages have something in common. They spread by conquest, they're colonial languages. Some languages are trading languages with very low prestige, say Swahili, or the Malay language, which is spoken as Bahasa Indonesia in uh, Indonesia. And that can be an advantage since they're nobody's language, yeah. They don't belong to the Portuguese. Uh, Swahili doesn't belong to anyone. Maybe in Tanzania it has, a, 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 how should I say, a claim to official recognition. There are many of those languages which are spoken sort of across the continent in, in Wolof, and Fulani. Uh, so the, sometimes the very fact that they're low prestige trading languages languages of vagrant uh, imams uh, um, <coughs> makes them more easy, easy to adopt. Uh, we'll <coughs> because people sort of hesitate to adopt the language of the other group if they're not forced to, uh, or if they don't find great advantage to it. So I didn't mention one language of large distance communication, the one I happen to be using now, English, of course. But English has become, in the last 50 years, a special case. It, all these sons of the super central languages revolve around one global language, and that's English. And if you want to remain in the metaphor of galaxies, in the knit of the galaxy is a black hole. And fortunately, what black holes sort of absorb, suck up everything that comes in their vicinity and are surrounded by light, and, uh, uh, a glowing halo. Well, all that applies to English. So English is the black hole of the language galaxy. And we will see what consequences that has. Now, does this always work? No, of course it doesn't always work. Uh, but let me give you an example. And I had a hard time finding a good example, honestly. An example of a uh, national language 
uh, Portuguese, which is spoken in Brazil as the language of the, the state, uh, but probably there must be hundreds or hundreds of other languages spoken by what, uh, the indigenous people who live on the continent, by immigrants who came, for example, in Sao Paulo, it, it, Italian is more widespread than Portuguese is. But at the same time, uh, Portuguese is a language spoken in Mozambique, in Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Macau, Goa. I'm not sure about Goa. They're still, still spoken there, yes. Uh, so <clears throat> that is an example of a national language uh, with connected to a, a supercentral language and sort of organizing around it all these peripheral languages. Now, Since we're talking about the, 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 the world system of, of languages and about the world system as such, I want to make two points about these global cultures. One is that uh, when there is a process of globalization, such as going on with English in the world and with these very long distance languages, what occurs on the ground is an increasing diversity of supply of cultural and consumer goods in any single place. Yesterday I did my shopping at Checkers and I had no trouble whatsoever finding anything I needed. Everything that's in Albert Heijn in the Netherlands, where I shop usually, was at Checkers, which is a supermarket, as no doubt you all know, in, in Stellenbosch. Nevertheless, I had an enormous problem finding butter. And I said, butter, butter. And for some reason, they didn't understand me. I don't know why. Finally, I found the butter, butter. And I think it was simply not on the menu of the young persons I asked about butter or butter, because they couldn't give me an answer. That is, uh, I, I didn't quite know what was happening. In general, there is increasing diversity of consumer goods, of cultural supplies, of uh, what's on the, on the program. But at the same time, at the global level, that means increasing similarity of all those local cultural and economic supplies. Uh, they're all the same all across. By the way, local diversity and global similarity are the definitions of a perfect mixture in chemistry. This, the perf a perfect mixture, no matter how small an amount you take from the mixture, contains all the elements of the entire mixture. And this also shows some, uh, some dilemmas people on the ground have in, on the one hand, enjoying the, the, the the, the pleasure and the, the comfort of an increasing supply, and on the other hand, finding out that they have become more and more the same as everyone else. And this has somewhat of a, a, an echo in the, the problem of languages, because <clears throat> a multiplicity of languages makes for diversity from a global perspective. And you will see the European Union or uh, the Indian Constitution or the South African Constitution of 1993 in very uh, elevated language uh, uh, promulgating the idea that there should be very uh, many, many languages promoted and facilitated in the realm. The European Union, which has already 27 languages, in its official, uh, right, uh, official publications, uh, sings the praise of the great diversity and richness of all these European languages. Uh, 
and it even promotes uh, minority languages, immigrant languages, just uh, in the same spirit as the South African Constitution. But the same may make for uniformity uh, from a local perspective, because if you encourage all those languages, it means that every group continues to speak its own language without much contact with the next one. If you refuse to face the fact that Romanians, uh, if you don't encourage Romanians to learn, say, what has now become the European language, uh, English, then they will continue speaking Romanian and think that they're very, very different from their neighbors, the Bulgarians who speak Bulgarian. Uh, whereas uh, the use of several languages and of languages of intercommunication will probably quickly dispel the idea that they're all that different. <clears throat> yes, I confess I do these things. I'm not going to bother you with, it's even worse. <laughs> I'm a barbarian among linguists. Um, so this is basically the, the idea of the, the, the uh, of a world system of languages kept together by multilinguists. Uh, several levels of language, peripheral, rather defenseless languages without all the accoutrements of a state language. State languages mostly fully equipped, then uh, long distance languages which almost always are somebody's state language, but not, not always, uh, but most of the time. And finally, the great presence of English. Why would we be speaking English here, but also in Rwanda since a few years, and also in the universities of Indonesia or of China? Uh, what is so special about English? My hunch is that if we formed a committee to decide what would be the world language, the last proposal we would come up with would be English. It has an impossible spelling. It is basically a creole of Latin, French, and, 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 and Anglo-Saxon words. Uh, it has all sorts of funny declinations. My proposal would be Spanish, but I know very few languages. There may be much better languages. English is, from an essentialist point of view, if you look at the, the properties of the language, totally unfit to be the world, world's language. I also find it very difficult to pronounce, as you may have noticed. You find it difficult to pronounce too, except for the native speakers. What happens? Well, I think what happens, we have to do something. We will have to ask a question from a perspective of political sociology or political economy, where you look at group behavior, people trying to maximize their opportunities and their income, groups trying to struggle for predominance. What exactly, how should you think of a language? And then one of the first things you realize is languages don't really belong to anyone. No one on his own can create a language. Zamenhof, Esperanto. No, he did not create a language. He created a blueprint of a language, which is already a fantastic accomplishment. And nobody can prevent others from speaking their language. The Turks against the Kurds. Yes, that's true. Uh, now, these properties of a language would make it in economic parlance what you call a collective good. A collective good is something which doesn't belong to anyone in particular, which cannot be created by anyone in particular, nor abolished by anyone in particular, and which does not lose in value when more people enjoy it. And the famous example, of course, is the commons. Most of you know the problematic of the 
have collected goods from the commons, the common grounds, the forests, which were shared by all the farmers who had their own little lots, uh, but the, the, the forest belonged to everybody. That doesn't exclude conflict, by the way, not, not at all. One problem with these common or collective goods is that in order to maintain them, uh, some collective action is needed. Uh, and individual users may at times have to moderate their exploitation. Of it. By the way, uh, the first uh, Nobel Prize in economics, to my knowledge, to a woman, was uh, a woman who, whose name escapes me for the moment, it will come back. Uh, Ostrom, yes, yes, yes. Uh, who studied the ways in which Californian farmers, who are super maximizers, sort of managed to keep the water uh, in their, the, 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 the water supply uh, to moderate their, <coughs> voluntarily moderate their use, uh, so that it would not be exhausted, a problem which is very familiar to you people and how they could do so without central authority by mutual coordination. Whereas every single farmer would, of course, be tempted to use as much as he could. But there you have the problem in a nutshell. How does this apply to language? Um, I think I'm not going to say yet. I'm going to talk about another phenomenon, and that is called standards or external network effects. Standards are formulas for the use of machines or for measuring which circulate in a community. And everyone knows that the more people use that standard, the more useful it, the more useful it will be to each one of them. So it's even stronger than collective goods where more people can use it without it being exhausted. Here it is, you have even more. If you have to decide which, uh, what kind of operating system you will use, you will probably have look so from the corner of your eye and think, I'm going to use an operating system for my computer, which is in very wide use for a number of reasons. The company who creates it won't go bust. It will be accessible for a long time. It will probably be very well developed. And I can communicate, this is the most important point, with as many machines and as many people as I can. Now, operating systems are not free goods. You have to pay uh, uh, a fee to, in order to use them. Sometimes the fee is hidden, but usually you have to. But there are other kinds of standards which are free. For example, the metric system and the imperial system of weights and distances which I think in this country were in competition. Did you have at one time the, the, the imperial system? Yes, up until 1961. Sir? Up until 1961. Beautiful. So you're one of the few countries which had a fight about the, uh, the, the imperial and the metric system. As far as I know, they're perfectly equivalent. You can express anything you want to say in the imperial system, in the metric system, and conversely. But people were looking from the corner of their eyes about neighboring countries and what was the most widely spread. Let's keep that in mind. So you, when you must pick a standard, you will pick a standard that's the most widely spread because its value increases with the number of users which in economics is rather exceptional. And free standards have no fence around them at all. And that means that a strange phenomenon can occur. Now probably the decision between imperial and metric was taken by the, the, the governments. But if the decision must be made by free, cho freely choosing individuals, they'll look from the corner of the eyes what the other guy does, and they will pick the standard that they predict will uh, spread fastest and widest. And that can cause a stampede. Suddenly, everybody goes for that one standard. 
because they predicted everybody else will. So these are self-confirming predictions. And sometimes it can go very fast. Now, people rarely freely pick what language to choose from a catalog of languages. It don't work that way. But there are moments when people or institutions have to select, select their languages. And if those institutions or individuals try to make up their mind, they'll probably pick the language uh, that they expect to be most widely used. Certainly, this very calculating, rational, maximizing individuals, quote, academic researchers, who know exactly which side their bread is buttered on, as we say in Dutch, pick the language they think is most widely spread so that their chances of publication and of being read and of getting uh, kudos for their accomplishments is maximal. And that language, <coughs> not so long ago, was French. And a little while before was German. And Russian has been very important. But do I have to ask you which language nowadays is the language of academic research? If you can tell me which language is winning, I'm quickly going to learn it and publish in it. But as a matter of fact, I already did so 50 years ago. Yeah? It is inexorable. So what we see in this case too is a stampede of people who all believe, and probably rightly so in most cases, that English is going to be the language of research and commerce and financial affairs and what have you. Yeah? So there is nothing intrinsic in English, and certainly not the great Anglo-Saxon soul of the language, certainly not Shakespeare, uh, all due respect paid, that makes that English spread. But you and you and you and I and all these other people, think, well, probably if I want to make a career, if I want to give my children a chance for a good uh, opportunities, employment, we better pick English. By the way, we may be very sophisticated, I mean, you guys are very sophisticated, but people who know very, very little of what's going on in the world almost always want their children to go to schools where the language of widest circulation, in most cases English, is uh, taught. So what we have in many African countries is that people in public say, we need national language, Wolof, in education. We must uh, improve the chances of our indigenous forms of speech. And when they come home, they call the local English school, or the French school, and make sure their children go to the... It is uh, public nationalism and private op uh, op opportunism, but it's about your kids. I, I, I totally sympathize. All over, if, uh, people, people want their children to go to the schools where the language is taught, which maximizes their employment opportunities. This is one very important mechanism by which the very large language is spread, and by which, by the way, uh, in many, many African countries, uh, the colonial language is still the official language of the land. But there is another amazing mechanism. Let me talk about, talk about Senegal, which is, uh, I take as an example. In Senegal, correct me if I'm more than five percentage points off, in Senegal, I think 45% of the population is, identifies itself as Wolof. It's the dominant ethne in the country. Another 40% are Serea or Diola or Mandingo or Malenke uh, or Fulani. But many of them speak Wolof because it also happens to be sort of a local uh, uh, lingua franca. And you pick it up if you're a railroad worker or if you're an itinerant preacher, whatever. You, you sort of learn to speak Wolof. 
So when S Senegal became independent, I think it was in 65. Is that right? Well, if you don't know it, I don't need to know it. <laughs> uh, of course, almost all Senegalese, now it's the great moment to introduce a rooted language that goes with the, the, the spirit of our nation uh, and which comes from the very soil we live on. You know the soil of nationalism, actually. And I completely sympathize. I underwrite it. But the next phrase was, which national language? And then the silent, the tacit answer was, not yours. So here you have, and this occurs in, in many, many countries, not just in Africa, it's typically also the situation in Congo, in Nigeria. So instead of picking Wolof, they choose, they didn't make a choice. And they certainly, if they were not original Wolof, uh, if they were, didn't belong to the Wolof ethnic, and even if they spoke Wolof very well, they were not going to speak the language of the historical oppressors of the warrior tribe of the Wolof who had been involved in the slave trade, etc., etc. Certainly not, because the idea was by speaking Wolof, you somehow underwrite the Wolof nation, which is not such a far-fetched idea. So there was sort of a standoff. Which language are we going to speak? Not yours. And which language remained? French. Uh, these are very important mechanisms by which explain the strange phenomenon that in many African countries, but also in many Asian countries, the language which survives to this day as the language of national communication, the language of the state, of advanced education, <laughs> is the one language basically nobody wants, French. It also means that there are two kinds of French. One kind of French which you learn in school, and one kind of French which you pick up in the street which they call patois. Okay. The difference is, if you speak low French, patois, you drive a taxi, and if you speak high French, you ride a taxi. It's a class difference. Okay. And it's a very significant class difference. By the way, Senegalese researchers increasingly publish in English. So there are sociological and economic explanations for the persistence of colonial languages uh, and for the incredible rapid spread of languages of long distance communication, which are entirely devoid, uh, separate from the intrinsic qualities of the language. It's much more about what opportunities they promise and what you expect others to expect that will uh, the language to be. And the prob a problem which you're quite familiar with, the problem that by speaking the language of a, let me say, uh, group which is somehow in which you are, with which you are in direct competition, you don't want to take that, to adopt that group's language because they might think they were, were better than you are which is called language jealousy. Okay. What I want to do now is show you some images. Here it is. Uh, it's, I, maybe I can make it bigger. No, I'm not going to make it bigger. I don't want you to see the details. This is Barre, who wrote, did a study of <coughs> translations between various languages, book tr translations. We have rather good stati statistics by UNESCO about translate, at least we think they're rather good because we have no, nothing to compare them with, uh, of translations in the world from year to year. And Barre made a scheme of what you could call a world system of translations in which those arrows uh, show preferred translations, let me say, most frequent translation from one language group to another. Uh, up there, right, a very big green circle, 
is Russia. Russia is the biggest translator and translates and both into and from Russia, more is translated than in any other language. But look at the year, it's before 1997. And look at this one, that's English. Uh, and that's French over there. Now you don't need to see the details to see what happened in the next years. Look at Russia, it's minimalized. And look at English, it's growing. French is losing a bit, but still maintaining its position. Okay, so this is French, and that is, that's German, it's not doing so badly either. There's a little, uh, the Netherlands, which isn't doing badly either, here it's over there, that's, well, that. Formerly, teachers used to have a stick, or a laser. <laughs> Yeah, and that's rather, I, th those are the Scandinavian countries who translate to, into one another, and like the Netherlands have quite a bit of money to buy books and, tra and make translations. By the way, I told you language learning goes upwards. Translation goes downward. That is, the English-speaking countries translate much fewer books from other languages than uh, other la there's a much from books and from other languages than are translated from English into those other languages. In other words, if you're a Dutch author and you need to be, you would like to be translated, your chances in English, of course, your chances are much less than an English author to be translated in Dutch. The world is profoundly unfair. So I was forced to write my books in English, as all non-native researchers nowadays are. And my, I wrote my last book about the re resistance to emancipation in Dutch. And lo and behold, I really have a hard time to get it translated in, uh, in English. Now see what happens next. The Russians are still losing. and. Uh, English is more and more looking like the black hole, the hub of the universe. This is a funny little constellation. These are Pacific Island countries which consistently translate each other's books in those other. And up there, the Swedes and this, that one up there is Scandinavia. They also are very interested in each other. And they have, I'm surprised about this one because the Scandinavians have a lot of money, but I wasn't where, where that Tonga and Samoa did so much translating. So really what you see is a little movie. I'm going to show you again. You see a transformation in the world system of translations, which is very coterminous with the world system of languages, no surprise. So you don't read, need to read the book. You must just have seen the movie. You see? Bum, bum. By the way, this is world system of translations has been pioneered by uh, Shapiro in Paris and Helbron. They have started work on the world system of translations. Uh, and here's Barre who did these very involved statistics. So this is our further elaborations of the idea of a global system of languages of bridging from one language to another in, uh, uh, into a sort of systemic view. The title of the article I last wrote about how much we started at 10, 10 past, it's 10 minutes to two. Five minutes? If I have five minutes, I'm going to stick out my neck and talk about South Africa, which I do with minor tremble. I won't talk more about translation, but I want to talk about uh, South Africa. Uh, 
I read a little bit on what is going on in the University of Stellenbosch and the shift, a very contested and controversial shift from Afrikaans as a leading language of teaching and research towards English as the leading language of teaching. But, and it's, I see what's at stake, I can see that this is really important and painful and, and uh, controversy, but I was struck by one fact. Almost all universities in the world that were not originally English speaking are shifting to English. And I was saying, making a really dumb remark to Lloyd, I was saying, what if we ignore the entire discussion that's going on in Stellenbosch about Afrikaans and about parallel and dual language systems and about what has gone on under apartheid and about the, uh, uh, let me say, underprivilegement of the, the African, uh, indigenous African languages, would there still have been a shift to English? Well, this probably not, or maybe. But the shift to English occurs everywhere. So, as in Stellenbosch, very incisive discussions of high principle and, uh, are being carried on passionately, uh, at the same time, they are moving in a direction which everyone is. Probably one point is that researchers have an immediate interest in publishing in English. If you publish in Afrikaans, you're not even read in the Netherlands because Dutch people believe that Afrikaans is different from Dutch and the Boers did everything they could to make them believe that was so because they wanted their national Boer language. And when I look at discussions in, 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 in universities in many countries, there are all sorts of substantive, locally grounded discussions of principle, why they should or should not shift, but in the end they shift. I find that remarkable. If French would have been the language of world communication, what would the, the, the discussion at Stellenbosch have looked like? Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that a very local discussion, which I have with all due respect, which high principle and very thoroughly thought out, occurs, and at the same time, the end result is so similar to all other academic environments across the world. When I first wrote in 2001 about South Africa, the 1993 constitution had been adopted, and I read something which again was very familiar to it, because in the constitution it said that they were going to promote and support and encourage all African, no not all, there's many more, at least 11 African languages and sign language. And they, there was a, a summing up, uh, there was, uh, uh, let me see, uh, Northern Soto, and can I do a click closer? I worked very hard on that one, closer. <laughs> and Zulu, and Pede, and there was, uh, 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 all these languages were enumerated as if they were, uh, consistent bodies of speech and writing. And when I, and of course Afrikaans and English. And when I saw that, I said, well, that means English will be winning. On theoretical grounds, which I just, uh, most people must have thought that English would be winning, but I could say so without knowing almost anything about South Africa, except that they were encouraging very many languages. And my motto is, the more languages, more English. Because the European Union does exactly the same thing, even to this day. They call their 27 languages the great richness of European culture. Congratulations. And they encourage not only those 27 languages, but ethnic 
minority languages and immigrant languages and let them all flourish and flower. But of course they don't. And the very decision to, uh, to encourage all these languages means that the chaos will be such that only one language will survive, and that's English, exactly what is happening. The French, who were the major competitor and were in a, a very strong position before England in 1973, entered uh, Great Britain, entered the European Union, saw it coming. They had hoped that they would become the language of Europe. Uh, and the most, the cleverest among these friends, the French in the European Union, are very clever, proposed, okay, let's have Polish, Spanish, English, and French. That's a manageable number of languages, and that would keep maybe English out of a pure monopoly position. There's one problem, the Italians protested. And if the Italians were allowed to Portuguese, that you can imagine what's going on. Uh, so basically, I did a little study of voting probabilities. You could see that if this thing would have been put to the vote, they would have increased the number of official languages time and again, up till 28, and then somebody would have come back and said, well, let's take only English. Uh, the South African situation is in very many respects comparable to the European Union, and to India, which has a, a similar situation. So, uh, by the way, some very respectable people in 1993 had already proposed to sort of consolidate a number of so-called Bantu languages. Here I must uh, make a uh, point. I do not know the value of the word Bantu, so bear with me when I use it. It's a very controversial word, I understand. But what was called Bantu languages, and I think at the time Kwesi Pra, who was a Pan-Africanist, and Neville Alexander said, let's do exactly what the, Euro the French proposed the Europeans do. Let's take a small number of languages, let's call one of those language groups Nguni, and the other Sutu, and each of them brings together a number of Bantu languages, and then we would have only four languages that would be manageable. And we could really do serious work in, say, uh, building up this Nguni or Sutu with all the accoutrements, with the whole apparatus of a completely equipped, modern, written, printed, broadcast language. Uh, but it didn't happen, probably because uh, of the narcissism of minor differences. They look, uh, Northern Soto is very different from Southern Soto. Uh, you know the dialogue. And probably uh, because adopting the variation of the other group would somehow imp have implied deference to the other group and was unpalatable. So there you are with 11 languages. There were two strong languages, English and Afrikaans, and even Afrikaans is diminishing under the onslaught of English. Now, I'm aware that in very naive and simple terms, which you are going to correct me, I'm the one person who is most ignorant about this, so you're going to teach me in the next moment, uh, and that in, on the ground, the situation is very different. And much more is known now about the situation on the ground because there are such good uh, sociologists and anthropologists of language, such good statistics. Uh, Lloyd Hill, for example, did his very detailed study in uh, Nelson Mandela Bay, Port Elizabeth. But what really happens in households, what really happens on the job, what kind of languages people speak. Uh, Dermot has done such work, uh, Poser, uh, and, so, and when you look at what they, they find, it is much more complicated and much more rich, and many more languages are sort of playing through each other 
than when you take the far away look. But I'm afraid that my message is that English is going to continue its onslaught as the great black hole hub of the universe. But we don't know, but languages can be very resistant and we cannot predict what, be, what will be spoken at home. In what languages are you going to write your love poems? Please do. Uh, how you are, uh, when you are out having a good time, what you will speak. It will be probably much more fluid, much more complicated than you can. But I think we can predict what the official, highly educated, internationally oriented f uh, uh, use of language will be. That will be increasingly in English as it is the world over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avram. I'm going to open it up. Uh, we have about half an hour, I think. So, um, just, uh, give us your name. Um, and, uh, and yeah, everybody. I think everybody. Go, go for it. Hello. Um, yeah, my question is this morning, interestingly enough, I listened to a radio program where they spoke about how, um, especially trains now, is becoming more infused with, with English. Mm. Um, and I was wondering, of, um, in my understanding, Mandarin is becoming the official language to conduct business in. Yes. But yet they employ people to come teach English as a foreign language. Yes. So, what politics will, yeah, what's the play there? You're talking about China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the Chinese say that 300 million people now speak English. But when I left my hotel in Beijing, all those 300 million people were hiding behind the bushes because I couldn't find a single person who could show me the way. Uh, I really can't tell. There are a number of problems with uh, the sociology of language in China. One, one is that the Chinese government insists that all Han languages are mutually comprehensible, not only in writing with their characters, but also in speech. That is the thing you say when you are a patriotic Chinese. Most social linguists who have done studies on the ground deny this. But it used to be so that they didn't say that except in a little footnote, otherwise they couldn't go, go back to their uh, research area. So we don't really know what exactly is the degree of mutual understanding among the Han speakers. We do know that they all learn, no, we are being told that they all learn Potonghua, which is the, 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 the modern version of Mandarin in school, but if they really do, we don't know. There's too little sociology on the ground going on and too much censorship. About 10 or 20 years ago, the Chinese government decided to have a big program in English. Uh, where that has gone, I, I frankly don't know. Um, but I must say, I haven't read the latest on it, so maybe other people can tell us more. For the time being, I do not think that Chinese will be a serious competitor in international uh, context with English because it takes the stampedes into and out of a language, abandoning a language, are both slow stampedes, if that is not an oxymoron. Because it takes a while to learn a new language and it takes a long time to forget it, or to the way languages die, not teach them to your children. That is how lang languages disappear. So this will not go fast. After all, Latin kept it for 2,000 years. Now English won't keep it. For but if your children want to know whether they should learn Chinese or English, English.
Yes. Well, I was in a committee which for the Dutch Royal Academy of Sciences had to propose a language policy and I could wrap it up in Dutch in four words. In Netherlands, tenzij, Engels, mits. And mits doesn't exist in English. It means Dutch uh, unless, English on condition that. Or in computer language, Dutch is the default language, but you can push the option of English. Because having been such a cosmopolitan cynic, when it comes to my own languages, I'm as sentimental as you, all of you, uh, it goes too quickly in the Netherlands. And therefore, I think there must be good reasons to use English, and there are many, many good reasons. But there may not be a solution. In a way, English is the solution. If those Americans weren't so damn arrogant. Uh, I wrote in my book that it would be much easier for Europe to adopt English as its official language if only the, uh, Britain were, were not a member of the EU. And lo and behold, they left. So now maybe we can speak English without it's appearing that we defer to the Brits, the last thing we will want to do. But my formula would be encourage people to have their children learn the language which gives them the greatest opportunities to live a happy, which also means a wealthy or not, not to have employment opportunities, opportunities to, to develop themselves. So it means encourage learning either the language of the land or the language of long distance communication which is current there or English but try to convince them of one fact if they give up the language of the village or of the community it may simply disappear so they have a responsibility to cherish it uh, and that also means if the language is given up the complete heritage of everything that was invented in that language, or memorized, or confined uh, uh, to, to, to paper, or to prints, or to hard disks, becomes inaccessible except for specialists. So how can we convince people, yeah, go ahead and speak English, but please, please realize the treasure of your elders, and I think that can be explained, but we must really <coughs> tell them you have a responsibility to, to, to safeguard the heritage of your people by continuing to speak the language, to sing the songs, to make the, do the dances, because if you don't, it will disappear. So it is a double-pronged approach. I have a paragraph. I'm a PhD student in this department. I just wanted to ask him, um, Esperanto was a thing in 1995. I remember my parents, we were in the cassette industry before the, before the yeah. university. Yeah, well, they, were, they were printing out the Open University in England at that time, had a big run on you know, Esperanto and teaching across Europe. If you can tell me a bit more about the death of Esperanto. And then the other thing was like the you know the French I think have I think it's the Alliance Francaise. The French have La Real Academia de Español, no? Yes. And English never had this. Now that English is becoming the as you say the the black hole, shouldn't uh, is there not talk about standardizing English and making it easier as you say for mm. if everyone's having to yeah. learn? Mm -hmm. There's one rule and then one thousand and one exceptions in English, right? Simplify English. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, it, uh, Britain has the British Council, uh, uh, which is very active in, and as a matter of fact, people like uh, Robert Philipson, but a whole lot of people think that English spreads because of language imperialism, and they sincerely believe there is a British Council, uh, sort of a CIA, which is sort of in top. Uh, uh, selling English to you and, 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 and pushing it. There are, sort of like, there are books called English as a Hydra, like many-headed uh, 
snake that eats all other languages, or people like me, which accuse it of being a black hole. Uh, if only the spread of English were the result of a conspiracy, we could maybe do something about it. No, it's the result of you making a calculated decision on the basis of your expectations of others, and there's nothing we can do against that. It is a real uh, stampede. One of the greatest delusions somehow, which somehow the, especially the British succeed, is that English is, people believe that English is easy. I don't know why, but if you have French is very difficult, English is easy, German is very difficult. But English is very, very difficult. And just after the war, they had a little book called Basic English. I don't think anybody here in the room remembers, but I remember as a kid. And it started with the little stick puppets, and it said, I. And in 40 pages, you learned 60 words of English, and you thought it was very easy. You know? I don't know why, how, but this is another aid to the spread of English. But I think I know, if you speak French, people will, it's a langage de pédant. It is a language of people who correct you. If you do not speak the, the, uh, the, co the, the past conjunctive correctly, you are out of it. Almost nobody corrects you in English. It's sort of a free for all, uh, unless you talk to, 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 to Oxford Dons of America or the authors of the New York Review of Books, but the illusion is that English is true. In the meantime, one of the marvels of English is that it doesn't break apart in all sort of different Englishes. It does, but the elite versions of English the world over are mutual, perfectly intelligible, and they will remain so. Why? Because that's precisely the reason of speaking English, that if you're an Australian uh, uh, trader and you're a Canadian preacher, you can still understand each other. These elites have a vested interest in maintaining a, com a universally intelligible version of the language. The Dutch and the Afrikaners, or the Afrikaners had reasons to separate from Dutch. I'd love to give another class on why Dutch disappeared from the world. Once we were so important. Uh, but apparently the Boer elites didn't find it important to keep communicating with the Manabrutus, their brethren in the Calvinist faith in uh, the Netherlands. Probably at the moment that the Calvinists in the Netherlands turned away from the Boer Calvinists. But that's another story. Yeah. 
that I want to I, I, I want to believe that English actually will be maintained as a lingua franca rather than the language that swallows all the others up. No, you, so that's, you're correct. That's, yes, that's yes, my, yes, yes, yes. So uh, I agree, and I hope that in daily people daily lives in the office in, 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 at home wherever they go to, to, to dances, they will use all sorts of languages uh, and sometimes very diversified versions of English mm. or Creoles. Uh, but I think that increasingly when they need <coughs> to, to uh, communicate with very, very, uh, very uh, at over distances or with groups of people which are relatively foreign or alien to them, they will use English. I know, they, I have in this uh, article a, a scheme by a guy, uh, uh, Mayer, who did a world system of English, and who sort of superimposed on this world system all sorts of versions of English. But the idea that English would break apart be, uh, because it's so white is I think wrong because elites have such a tremendous interest in keeping communicates with all one another. I didn't find it very easy to always understand the African as opposed to the European English speakers in the seminar which we just I had to sit a little bit closer, make a little bit more of an effort, but I'm sure at the moment one of those African or European speakers of English thinks that he's no longer, say, universally intelligible for the elite's users to adapt. Because it's precisely the point of speaking English. So again, from a sort of a, a, a political sociology, political economy point of view, uh, you can predict that there will be this sort of universal, rootless version of English will maintain itself. No matter what happens on the ground, and we know all sorts of things. There's so many English-based Creoles, uh, for example. I'll ask a question. If you want another one? Yeah, another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Um, no, no, quickly. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask a similar question to, to what you asked, and what my question is, but if, if English becomes the official language to conduct business or, or, or for, for the elites or the academics yeah. to converse with each other, wouldn't it deepen inequalities where people do not speak English yeah. or cannot? Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. And again, some people speak in English which is unintelligible beyond their community. Uh, I'm very familiar with Surinamese society, which is a small country between French and British Guiana where they speak not a Dutch Creole, but an English Creole, because in the 17th, 18th century it was English. So it is a West African English Creole. Uh, you don't get anywhere with it. If you want to get somewhere, you have to learn uh, Dutch. It's one of the few places. And most people do speak Dutch and English. Uh, and this means you're already saying elementary school and high school. So. As I mentioned, in, with French in, in Senegal, some people pick it up in the street, they can ride it, drive a taxi. Some people are in the school, they can afford to take a taxi. But these are real class differences. Uh, what can we do against it? Uh, improve our schools, subsidize uh, our schools, and overcome the idea that are somehow uh, something inappropriate about teaching uh, people in the villages or people in the townships the languages of wider communication. No, well, it's a way of uh, improving yourself, of having more opportunities. Yes, it's a colonial language. Yes, it's an imperialist language. Go on. But it's also the language in which anything that can be said again. Anything that can be said against capitalism is said in English. And that's why it's spread the world over. The same goes for French. If there is one non anti imperialist 
Eh? Anticolonialiste, it was the language of Fanon and Césaire and Antoldian. So uh, don't be too, how should I say, essentialist about this. Of course, English is not transferred. Of course, by speaking English, you sort of yield to certain uh, choices of words and expressions which have a colonial shading to it. And that is what we constantly criticize. But it is still the language of the ANC. <laughs> Okay. Uh, our problem, uh, sorry, uh, if I wanted to borrow a criticism, which is not yeah. completely my criticism of what you're doing here, I mean, you, you're presenting us with a, a kind of a model, it's a very compelling model, yes. right, of how the world language system works. But, but what you're doing, like Wallace Stein, is you're deploying a kind of macro system system. Yes. If I wanted to, I mean, that 20, 30 years ago, system thinking went out of fashion in yes. sociology. Okay, it's associated, associated with Talcott Tal 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 Parsons, whose thinking yeah. also tended to be very strong in this, in this, in this particular department. Um, how do you think about systems thinking, about the, the importance of systems thinking? Obviously, you wanted people to bring you in. How would you defend the kind of, the, the kind of macro systems orientation that, 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 that you're drawing on here, while recognizing that obviously there were good reasons why not just postmodernists, but Marxists became very yeah. critical of, of, of the systems thinking of people yeah. like Talcott Parsons? So oh, first of all, I mean, from Talcott Parsons to Emmanuel Wallerstein is quite a jump. Uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, I think he's still alive. Yes, yes. yes. Is a Marxist who believes in long-term economic, and each he came about every other year to the school in Amsterdam where I, which I directed, and to predict that next year the great global prices would occur, and then behind his back we were laughing about it. He was the opposite of Parsons in a way. He was, in, for him, the, the, the world system is not only a system of inequality, imperialism, and exploitation, but it's also obviously a system in constant evolution. He maybe should have called it the world process. Uh, I took the idea of world system lock, stock, and barrel from Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, and then did with it what I wanted to do. But words like periphery obviously come from there. Uh, I think that what is going on in in, in those uh, in that what I have presented here is a way to make a huge jump to sort of find a framework in which you can organize all sorts of things. And one of the problems we're confronted with is obviously many of the things we think are national or local or even continental are intricately connected to global processes. That, by the way, is a Marxist idea or is perfectly compatible with mine. But as soon as you have presented pictures like these, you must start to pick them apart and say, hey, look, he says French, but it's really patois. Or he says that happened in 97, but now we are in 2020. So you make the great gesture, and then you start to adjust and criticize all the time. And then after a while, you try to see if it still can stand on its feet. But sometimes it simply disappears. It cannot stand the criticism. Other attempts. And sometimes you say, yeah, OK, notwithstanding all these objections, this still is the best way of organizing our knowledge we now have. We can only hope we will have another one soon. So what scientists do is try to find patterns in the chaos. Uh, and our work is to constantly criticize those, but not to abandon generalizations too quickly, because you might not have a better one. Mm. Thank you. We still have five minutes. Anybody else? Sociologist in the department. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Not in the department. 
We already know if those can work together. Now my, my question is actually about the role of French and the role of English on the African continent. Yes. My mother was French speaking, so I've traveled to universities in West and in Central Africa. I have doctoral students who write in French here. Really? And I, I talk to people at universities in South Africa by saying to them that the major wall, the major divide in sub-Saharan Africa at the university level is that of the two colonial languages, yes. French on the one hand and English on the other. And many of them can't speak to one another. I mean, if you go to Gabon, which has many countries with many languages, yes. you go to Cameroon, you go to Ivory Coast. Um, when I go to those universities and speak French, they say to me, it's very difficult sending students to South Africa because they don't have English. French. They, they, don't, have, they, they, well, they don't have English if they would come oh, here. These people from those yes. countries. I, I so, so my question really is, looking at um, CEMAC, is the Central African group of countries, all of which are Francophone, even Equatorial Guinea, which is becoming Francophone. What should they do at the universities given the black hole of English? I mean, it's a difficult question, but do you think that they ought, do you think that they will and that they ought to move toward an Anglophone curriculum given as you probably know better than I do, that France very much would like to maintain them as part of the greater Francophone world. Yes. <coughs> Can I add to this? Yes. If I had to say three words what the French should do, it would be lick your words. Yes, okay. Because, um, but I wouldn't say that in France. No, I wouldn't dare to do that. I want to think about German, which was in a position very similar to French. It was the one of the, or maybe the great language of science. It has a great literary, great philosophical tradition. Uh, one of the great European languages which spreads across the world, but after 1918, when the Germans lost the First World War, their colonies were mostly taken over by other Western powers. They lost. They hadn't got the message yet, so there was another war, and then they lost completely. And German hardly exists as a language of global communication. It is very important still as a language of European continental communication. But after the transition, the fall of the Soviet Union, for a moment it seemed that German might prevail in these East European countries. And they have lots of German teachers still. But the Russian teachers quickly uh, turned, uh, learned English and became English teachers, and now German is not going to exist vis-a-vis uh, -vis English in Eastern Europe. The French, thank God, are not in comparable position as Germany was in 1945, but they will, the French will not expand beyond the limits where it's now, and many, many of its researchers are now speaking, uh, in Senegal are speaking, uh, using English. Uh, I taught in French universities and at the Collège de France where I had to teach in French it was really, and I had to write my note. Not only that, I'm still very chauvinistic, so I had a very hard time. Uh, but even there, this, this tout bon chauvinism, you remember the Roi tout bon, where the conferences in, in Paris had to be in French, and the Americans finally shut up. Uh, but of course, this could not be maintained. 
So far, the French are bad losers, but they're losers. They're, uh, and increasingly, at Sciences Po now, class, many classes are taught in English because of this fantastic European Erasmus program, which encourages students to go all over Europe and study at foreign universities. But what happened instead, instead of increasing the diversity of cultural and linguistic experience, the, these students, the university started competing for these foreign students for economic reasons and began to uh, create classes and entire curriculums in English, even in Paris, especially in Holland. And what do these kids do? They have English classes in Amsterdam, sit in coffee shops smoking <laughs> little joints, going to dancings and listen to English pop, pop music, which they might have well done in Berlin or in Madrid. Uh, local, uh, increased local diversity is global similarity. Their experience in Madrid is exactly the same as in Amsterdam. So the French make a very respectable effort to, to maintain and to protect their language. Uh, and they have all my sympathy, but it will not expand. And academics already are leaving the fray and are using English. Uh, and for the French, as it was for the Germans, that's especially difficult. The Dutch don't have a grand tradition. We adapt easily. But for the French, as for the, initially for the Germans, after, before the great disaster, they are peoples with a grand tradition. And the French have a hard time adapting to English much harder than, for example, the Dutch. So it's, it's not a satisfying answer, but is it a realistic answer? <laughs> OK, Abram, just a final word of thanks. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, Abram has actually been attending a workshop um, for the last three yeah. days with about 11 other academics uh, from around South Africa, one of the international. Very interesting. Um, thank you again, and thank you all for coming. If you want to join us for the uh, round table, again, I don't know the exact room number, but at 3 o'clock I'm going to stand at that a glass door and the other end there and let you in and show, show you where to go. If you want to come back to discuss, discuss um, Art, Art Rom's chapter and maybe get into, get into the, some of the nitty-gritty of his economics of language more in more detail, you're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, everybody.